Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, church. It's good to be back together today. Um, I love that song, and uh, this is the third time I got to hear it this morning. I was over at uh, Xenia Naz this morning praying with uh, Mark Atherton, and his worship team was practicing that, and I was over at Liberty Worship with uh, Pastor Todd uh, praying with him this morning, and their, their worship team was singing that too. So uh, we're going to talk about unity today, and it's good to know the body of Christ is uni- unified in worship as well too. Isn't that amazing? So they were rocking a little bit more at Liberty, but that's okay. Just, you know, different styles. That's okay. So it's good. Um, my name is Will Urschel, one of the pastors here, and uh, I'm still kind of in my COVID recovery, but feeling better. And uh, one of the things I've noticed is I, about uh, eight or nine o'clock, uh, uh, I, I'm just whipped and I got to go to bed. And, uh, and actually, that's okay, because I, I probably need to learn what it means to actually sleep instead of just staying up all night. But uh, uh, last night, Kim and I, for the first time in a long time, got to sit down and uh, do something together. We watched the Ohio State. Anybody watch the Ohio State game last night? Good. It was over after about 10 minutes, but it was a good game. Uh, but it was nice because, you know, there was no tension. It was just very relaxing. You knew where the outcome was going to be after the second quarter, and you could just enjoy that, right? And I got a phone call. Normally, you know, about this time of night, uh, I, I, don't, I don't answer your calls. And some of you may say, well, will you never answer our calls? But I, I definitely don't at this time of night. But it came up on the caller ID, Eric Moore. And uh, normally I wouldn't answer Eric's calls either, but I, I thought, well, it might be Tabitha, right? You know, and so you do need to answer Tabitha's call. So I, I picked up, and it was Eric. I didn't hang up on him. But uh, he had mentioned that their family had a couple of uh, items they'd like to donate to the church, and, you know, we have some need. And I said, that sounds great. And right before he hung up, he said, yeah, and uh, really looking forward to you uh, preaching tomorrow. And I said, Eric, I'm, I'm not preaching tomorrow. And he goes, yeah, I talked to Steve earlier today, and you are. And I said, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. So it's about 8.45 at this time, you know. And uh, so I thought, well, I, I probably need to call Steve. So I, I called Steve and said, Steve, how are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm reading to my kids. And I'm having a great evening. And I said, good. Hey, uh, are you preaching tomorrow? And he goes, no, no, you are, Will. I said, oh. I said, Lord, come quickly. Let's pray. Because there's a, there's a good chance Christ could return. I mean, he could do it right now, too, right? So we'd have to worry about it. But I, I, I you know, kind of looking at how things are going, and I can't, suppose when the time is. I said, well, Steve, one of us probably better. I said, first of all, I'm glad we had this conversation so that at, at uh, 1020 in the morning, we're not both sitting out there in the audience waiting for somebody to show up uh, here on top, which, <laughs> you know, with the four of us doing the, the preaching thing, it's pretty amazing that has not happened much in the past, but for whatever reason did this time. But you know, the good thing is we've been reading through Ephesians through the week, right? And so, you know, Steve's been reading through it, and I've been reading through it, and we've been getting prepared already. So we've been learning some good uh, methods of getting ready for the Sunday morning. So I said, Steve, it's okay. We'll be fine. So I went back out, and I was, I was debating whether I should tell Kim that I was going to be preaching today, and I didn't. I just told her, I said, well, I'm, it's 9 o'clock. I'm going to bed. So I did. And then I snuck out later on when she didn't see that I was up. So, <laughs> so anyways, that all said, please come back at 6 o'clock, because I'm sure you're going to get Steve's position on some things <laughs> after you've heard me this morning. But uh, I love Ephesians. Uh, I, I've always, it's been one of my favorite uh, books of the, of the New Testament. And I, in, in my mind, it and Romans contain all of the richness of the gospel. And if there's, if there's nothing else that you could read, read, read Romans and read Ephesians, and, uh, and, and you'll get it there. So uh, let's go ahead and get started here. <coughs> um, Give me that next slide if you could. <clears throat> so I just want to do a little bit of review. <clears throat> Greg, Greg's reviews are a lot more detailed and, and, uh, and, and wordy. So he's not here today, so I got to do my own. But <clears throat> we finished up Ephesians 1 through 3. And as you read Paul's epistles, all the writings of Paul, basically he does two things. He's, he takes a couple of chapters to tell you who you are in Christ. What does it mean to be called by God into God's family? And, and he just kind of sets that up and lets you say, and I, I don't care whether it's, it's Romans or Philippians or Colossians or Galatians, it's, he, he starts you off with that background. And then, after he's done this, so, so what we've done in this first three chapters, we've said, hey, God, did you get, you didn't do the calling, <laughs> God called you into his family. If you know who Christ is, God called you into his family, Right? through Christ, not through any of the good things any of us done, right? None of us get to boast about that. 
through the amazing work of Christ. And a lot of what we've talked about is, first off, make sure we're all grounded in where that calling came from, right? And that that calling is a universal calling to Jews and Gentiles and all of us, right? And that there's no other differentiation of how we come into God's family except through that calling. We all have that, that same calling. And then, and then the other thing he does, he says, this is what your new identity is, right? You're not who you used to be before. Because the instant, the second you came to Christ, right? All of our sins were forgiven, right? We have a new position. We're his children. We've been seated in the heavenly places. That's our position now, right? We have access to the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And it goes on and on and on. All these things that happened the second you came to Christ. That's our new identity. And he also talked about the resources that we have, right? All, we have Christ who's now seated at the right hand of the Father over all of creation. He calls us his friend and he says, he says, all that I have I'm given to you. My resources are yours. These are the riches of the things he's given us. Now, we may not act like we got them all the time, but they're there. We may not act like that's our identity, but that's who we are, right? So that's, that's what we looked at this as a background. That's what happened in chapters 1 through 3. And uh, <coughs> Greg finished up last week, the last part of chapter 3, was just a prayer for the church to remember these things, right? To help us. The, the one passage I love in that is, is, is the one he says, remember how deep and wide and long and tall is the love that God has for us in Christ. And if, if, if you ever want to pray for somebody, and you say, hey, how can I pray for you? And they go, oh, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of anything. So you need to say, well, I can think of something. Pray that. I just pray that you could remember to know, to be in awe, how deep and wide and tall and long is the love that Christ has for you, right? So now, this is that whole first part of Ephesians, okay? Who you are. <laughs> what is your calling? Be in awe of that. And now we're getting into Ephesians 4. And Paul flips the switch. He says, okay, you got that part. Now we're going to start talking about, I want you to lead a life that's worthy of that calling. What Paul is saying is, it's time now to start acting like who you are, not who you used to be. Because the used to be, before we came to Christ, we all got that down, right? wasn't hard. We, we, we didn't even work to do that. We lived that our whole lives. Okay? That's where all our thoughts and emotions and fears and doubts and anger and all the rest of that stuff comes from that. <laughs> and God says, no, now that I've done this for you, I want you to live like this. And it's not just to live, it's because I've given you a purpose in the church. I've got good works for you to do that I've created from eternity past. And they're specific for everybody in this congregation here. And those works, the works that Sarah's got are not the same works that I have. And the works that Don has is not the same that I have, right? The ones that Matt has are not the same as mine because they're distinct. And so God says, it's time to start living that out. So what we're going to be looking at for these next chapters 4, 5, and 6 is what does it look like to live that out? And what are the challenges in doing that? And what, what has God given us to equip us to actually be able to live that, okay? So I just want to kind of give you the, the big picture thing. Uh, when Greg's back, he'll, he'll say the same thing, but it'll, it'll, it'll be much more enumerated. That would be great, okay? But this is my simple version of that. So go ahead and give me that next slide. And I, and I, want, you to, I want to draw you back to one verse we had back in chapter 2 where, where Paul gave us a hint of this. He said, for we, in the midst of telling us who we were, he had to say this, for you were God's handiwork. Great, God created a new person, right? But guess what it is? He says, created in Christ Jesus, got it. That's, I'm a new creation in Christ, right? I'm a brand new thing that never existed before when I come to Christ, right? It never existed before, and it, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. That's what the angels are in awe of, because something that was broken and ugly and running hard from God is now a new creation in his family. But he didn't end there. He says, to do good works. That's the calling. It was a hint of this calling he's talking about, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So that was the hint of the calling there in that first three chapters. And these next three chapters are just going to be open to that wide open. 
now to us, okay? So today, we're going to take the first step in what that new calling looks like. Let's go ahead. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16 today. And let me just give you the big picture there. God, as part of this new calling, to do these good works, we're not lone rangers. We don't go do these things by ourselves. And you know what? God the Father never did anything by himself. God the Son never did anything by himself. And God the Holy Spirit never did anything by himself. They were always in unity of purpose and action. And the, and the Son and the Spirit were always in submission to the Father's plan in that. And remember Christ said, I don't, I don't call you slaves. I call you my friends. <laughs> You're part of my family. He's inviting us into this unity that we never experienced before. And part of that invitation is in the, in the, the unity of the, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But it's also an invitation for us to be unified here with each other, which we could never do before, but we can do now. Because why? Because we all have, we're going to talk some more about that, right? But he says, he wants us to live in unity with each other, with the members, with the other members of the body of Christ. That's the first part of that calling that he's got for us, okay? So if you'd all please stand with me. Let's go ahead and, and get that uh, next passage. I want us all to read this <laughs> together. And since I'm up here this morning, we're going to use the New Living Translation, which is the one I prefer to use. And uh, we'll go back to the NIV next week. That's right. But all, all your verses, your memory verses are in the NIV, but we're going to do the NLT here. So let's read this together. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults <coughs> because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Don't sit down. There's more to come. Let's look at that next slide. This is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and the complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Amen? Amen, church? Amen. You may be seated. Let's go ahead and, uh, and pray before we get going. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your plans for us. <clears throat> thank you for preparing for us from eternity past to be part of this body and to give us the ability to live in unity, which we've never known before. God, help us not to walk away from these amazing gifts, Father. 
And I thank you for your word. God, we just pray that your word would be sharp, cut through our hearts this morning. God, it would uh, encourage those who need to be encouraged. We we'll confront those who need to be confronted. God, uh, it, would, uh, it would spur us on to love and good deeds as well. We praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, what does unity look like? <coughs> wow, that's an interesting word. So we are the <coughs> what states of America? Oh, you say that again. We're the what? We're the United States of America. <coughs> so I guess all we, all we really need to look at is America, and we'll figure out what unity is, because it's in our title, right? <laughs> uh, <coughs> so... Uh, my wife gets worried about what's going on in the nation, and I'm a history buff, and I said, listen, nothing new under the sun, right? I mean, <clears throat> those of you who got to live through a part of the 60s, uh, uh, <clears throat> there's some pretty traumatic times in our country. We're having some now. Uh, but guess what? We had some pretty traumatic times in 1861 in our country, and, uh, and the 1880s in our country, and in the 1780s of our country. So, you know, trauma's been there before. But part of the deal is... <clears throat> Um, the United States of America is not the kingdom of God, and uh, so we do see a lot of disunity there within our country, a lot of tension, right? And some people would say, well, unity means you got to believe the same thing I believe, right? And if you could just come over and, and believe exactly what I believe and live like I live, then we'd all be unified and we'd all be okay. The problem is we got lots of people that have a concept of what that needs to be, and they're all pushing us to go live like that, and nobody's willing to take a step towards the other person at all, right? So that's, that's one flavor of unity that we could have. Uh, and we probably could come up with some other definitions, but thank God <laughs> he already gave us a definition of what unity is about. And he did it in this passage. And he did it way at the end of the passage. So we're not going to march through the passage from the beginning. We're actually going to go to the end, and then we're going to talk about how do we get there. So go ahead and bring that next slide up. He says, this is what unity looks like. And I want you to listen to these verses. He says, we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now I'm going to break that down into two subparts here. Go ahead and give me that next slide. The first thing is, God is not calling us to conform to each other. I hate to, I hate to, if, if you thought that's what this was all about, sorry, that, that's not where he's going. But he does call us to conform. He says, don't conform to the world anymore, right? But be conformed to who? To Christ. So part of the critical part of unity is each of us individually pursuing Christ in our lives. And if I just tell you, if you're not pursuing Christ, you're not going to have any kind of unity, okay? Because it's as you get to know who Christ is and you understand his heart and you have the same kind of compassion and drive he does, which he allows us to do because his spirit is with us, his word is before us, his people are around us, and his good works are ahead of us to go do. Amen? All those things are there, right? But if we stand still and we don't link up in any of those things, and that's each of our own individual responsibilities to do the things, then we're not conforming to Christ and we won't go anywhere with that. Listen to what he says. We will be mature in the Lord, Right? not in some philosophy of the world, some agenda. We're going to be mature in Christ. <laughs> Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. I only got one standard. You only have one standard. That's Christ. But I don't care what, I really don't care too much about what other people's standards are. It's irrelevant. I, at the end of the night, when I go to bed, I have to be honest before God. God, how did I do today? with what you were calling, you're calling on me. How did I do today? And you know what? A lot of times, <laughs> people around me may say I was doing okay, and I'd have to admit, today was a failure. Because I know 
what my motives were. A lot of times, you may never know what my motives are. You may just see the things on the outside, but I know. So does God. And there's a lot of times, I've got to confess. My motives weren't good. I wasn't conforming to the image of Christ. I met with our board at Bridges of Hope, our shelter. And uh, I'm the chair of that. Didn't really mean to do that, but they snookered me into doing it. And uh, I got really angry this week about some things people were saying about the homeless in our city. <laughs> the people who work on that board. But you know what? The first thing I had to do when we prayed with that group, because these are holy men and women, people I respect, I had to confess my sins because my anger was not a good anger. Okay? I wasn't conforming to Christ. And that's all I could pray about that night because that's where I needed to be. Right? So this is our individual call. You cannot walk away from this call because this is a starting point of all of those call, the rest of the callings in our life. You can't walk away from this. He says, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. If you get any other standard, any other thing you are following besides Christ, you are going to fail. That is our only calling that we have on us. And you don't need any greater calling. There is nothing bigger <laughs> to follow. There's nothing more worthy. There's nothing more uh, full of awe besides Christ to follow. That's it. That's the first thing that unity looks like, is someone who is following Christ. And the next thing is, <laughs> it's a diversity in the body. Did you get that? Because <clears throat> Friday morning was amazing piece of unity of the body of Christ. We had 45 tables out. I don't know if you guys believe we actually have 45 big round tables in this room. And it was the mayor's prayer breakfast. And uh, thank you, mayor, for having a prayer breakfast for us. And uh, I'll tell you, it was a little slice of heaven because you got to see men and women all through our community who were conforming to Christ were here with us. And to pray with them was amazing. Oh, I, I'll tell you, we had Greg uh, Delaney, who grew up here in Xenia and uh, had a great life. <laughs> and life crashed for Greg because of addiction. And he destroyed his life, he destroyed his family, he destroyed his health, and uh, he, was, he, was, he was in the hospital <coughs> and, and probably should have died from, from, uh, from, from some septic infection, infection he got through all this. And yet, he was here to testify about the saving grace of Christ, and that when he could get over himself and actually start conforming to Christ, God can do amazing things in his life. And you know what he said? He said, everybody in this room has a story. Everybody of us in this room has a past that's different from anyone else. Every one of us have been through hard things that nobody else has been through. Remember, God says, I'm the good shepherd. I walk with you when the pastures are green and fresh, but I walk with you also in the dark valleys. Everyone in this room has walked through a different dark valley from everybody else. And yet the shepherd walked with you and you get to testify to the fact that the shepherd was with you and walked you through that. And the reason he let you go through that dark valley is this, he knows there's somebody else in the body of Christ who's going to be coming behind you and they're going to be walking through that valley as well. And they need your encouragement the encouragement that they saw you come out the other side of that with the Savior and that he was with you, right? That's our diversity. We, God is not, he spread his gifts wide to all of us and none of us have the same spiritual gifts. He spread the families and lives that he's given you out and the hurts and the pain and the agony and the situations out 
in his ultimate wisdom so that as we walk through those things with him and we mature with him, we then can build up. Listen, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it does what? It helps the other parts grow. That's all of that was given. You know, when I was growing up, my folks got divorced when I was two. My dad left my mom in a hospital. She was homeless with two little kids. <laughs> that was my home. It was the hospital room where my mom was. And my grandparents had to come up and pick us up and take us home. And I grew up in the 60s without a dad. And, and I was the only kid in my school that didn't have a dad. And I thought, why, why do I have to live like this? Why does everybody else have a dad? And I don't have a dad. I didn't understand it. Well, I get it now because I know what it's like to have a broken family. Because I had, God allowed me to live through it, okay? And when somebody comes along and they're hurting with that, I said, I can empathize with you because I had to walk that as well. But you know what? God walked with me through that. He walked through that with me with the body of Christ. He brought other men and women and my grandparents into my life to walk that with me. And God has hope for you as well. Now, I don't know anything about addiction. My dad was an alcoholic, and it disturbed me so much to see what it did to my family that I, I stayed away from anything that I thought might influence me that way, okay? And so I have a hard time when folks are struggling with addiction. But you know what? There's other folks here in this body that's been through that. Thank God. God. That's where Greg Delaney was. And he knows. And he can walk alongside. And God has allowed <laughs> hundreds of men and women in the body of Christ to go through those things in our city so that they can walk along to help the other parts grow. They've got it. I, I don't know what it's like to grieve for losing a child. I have no idea. Steve and Emily know. They know. And we've had people in our, our church that have lost children. And I can pray with them. But you know what? Steve and Emily can really pray with them because they've been there. And they know that. This story goes on and on and on. Thank God we're not all the same <laughs> because we wouldn't be equipped to do the things that we need to do, right? So we're unified, we conform to Christ, that's part of unity, but we have a diversity of background and gifts, the richness that he's provided through the lives he's allowed every one of us to live so that we can help the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy, growing and full in love. Don't despair through the hard things that you have been through, I know it's hard to understand this. This is part of the richness of God. And he's not a God who's, who's hurting you because he's a God who says, I've been there. I came to your world. I put your body on. I suffered all the things that you suffer so that I can understand as well. And so that as we come to him to conform to him, we're conforming to a God who understands. He says, you freely get to come. In Hebrews, he says, you can freely come to me at any time. And we have a great high priest who empathizes with us because he has suffered as well. But he doesn't keep that joy of that empathy to himself. He's dispersed out to every one of us the ability to empathize and to participate in that joy. And sometimes that's, that's a hard thing for us to accept, but when you're on the backside of it, it's a wonderful thing to be able to offer to someone else. This is what unity looks like. <laughs> Let's keep going. Well, how did we get there? Because, listen, the instant I came to Christ, I got all this stuff. But the instant I came to Christ, I, all I know is who I used to be, okay? So somehow I got to get from 
being immature to being mature in Christ from not conforming to Christ to conforming to Christ. And somehow I got to start figuring out how to use all these things that God has given me to actually start building up the body because the instant before I came to Christ, I definitely wasn't building anybody up, okay? I probably was tearing a lot of people down. And I got to learn this, okay? This is part of our walk in Christ. Okay? So we're going to look at four things Paul brings out here about how we get there. First thing is, he says, remember what you have in common with everybody else in the body of Christ. He says, for there's one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Now, it's really easy to look at somebody that you're upset with and write them off because you set all these things up. And it's really easy to do that in the body of Christ. And I'll tell you, after being here at Emmanuel since 1979, I've seen it go happen again and again and again and again. And it, nothing special about our church. Uh, as I've been talking with the other pastors all over the other churches in town, it happens there too. We need to take a breath and realize, wow, we are part of one family, okay? And that's not just for those of us in this room here. That's true about Xenia Grace Chapel and Xenia Nazarene and Faith Community Church and AHOP and Zion Baptist and United AME, okay? All of our churches for folks that trust in this we're one with them I, I'll tell you it was, it was rich to be here and have Gary Chapman praying for us you guys know who Gary Chapman is Pastor Zion Baptist let me tell you when I die I want, I want Gary Chapman praying at my funeral I mean I just <laughs> that could be the best gift I could give to anybody uh, Gary has such a sense of the spirit of God and a burden for our community. Uh, I mean, I felt like there's, there was nothing left to get said after, after Gary prayed for us all. And, and I wish I had a recording of his prayer for us, okay? Well, G Gary, Gary's come to a whole different world than I have and a whole different life, and he's got a whole different church. And I know we have the name Baptist in us, but there's 23 Baptist churches in town. We're all different flavors of Baptist. But Gary knows that we all have what? One body and one spirit one glorious hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and the Father of all, and we are unified together in that. And you know what? So are each of us in here who have trusted in Christ, right? And, and that, those things we have in common are so much bigger than anything that may separate us, anything else that's happened in our lives or could ever happen in our lives unless we forget about them, in which case we'll, we'll pick something else out that we're not common on and we'll focus on that. And when we do that, you know what? If I did that with Chris, then I stopped being in awe of Chris, not because Chris is such a great guy, you know, and everything. Well, Chris is, Chris is a great guy because he's in Christ. Chris is a great guy because the ruler of the heavens and the earth <laughs> came to a cross to die for Chris. And that ruler calls Chris his friend. And that spirit of the Trinity that's been unified from eternity past lives in Chris's heart. Those are the things I need to be in awe of about Chris. And if I can start being in awe of those instead of being distraught about something else, then yeah, I can have some unity with Chris. Two, number two, let's keep going. Remember that we're each unique. And this is a uniqueness that everybody in this room needs from everybody else. Or you can't grow the way that God wants you to grow. Listen to this. However, he has given each one of us a special 
I want you to stop and think about it for yourself. God, I don't care what anybody's ever told you about yourself or how, how you feel about yourself. God says, I created gifts for you, especially for you. I knew about you from eternity past. And I've been waiting to give you those gifts. And the angels in the heavenly host are in awe that the creator of the universe would give you those gifts. And they're waiting in eager anticipation to see what's going to happen with those gifts. Because God didn't give those gifts to the angelic host. He gave them to us. God didn't allow the angelic host to go through those hard times walking with him so that we could be equipped. He gave those to us. Amen? Don't worry about the rain. We'll be okay. Our, our building is built to the, Xenia, the codes of the state of Ohio, so we're in good shape. I do know that much from being with the city. All right, there we go. He says, however, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ, not because you earned it, not because you deserve it, out of Christ's love only do we have this. As each part does its own special work, did you get that special work? It's not the same. A special gift and a special work that's unique to you that nobody else gets to do and nobody else was equipped to do. It helps the other parts grow. That's why we're here together. Not to get fed and be fat on the couch by ourselves. We're here to do your works so that you can help the other parts grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Many times we forget first that we even have these gifts, that we have a special calling for special work. And it's easy a lot of times to have an attitude of, well, I'm coming to be entertained on Sunday morning. I'm coming to be fed. I'm coming to do for me. And it's a lot of times very easy to say, well, you know, Herschel and Kowser and Holloway and Steve, right? They're the pastors. They're supposed to do that stuff. And, oh, yeah, we pay these other gals and guys to do stuff. And I'm, I'm just here to observe and critique how they're doing. And you, you've missed out. You've lost it. You, you have these special gifts and special work to do when you wake up in the morning with your family because I'm not there. I'm not with your family. You are. You got these special gifts and special work to do when you get on that bus to go to school, you hop in that car to go to school, you get in the car to go to work, because I'm not at your work. I'm not on your bus. I'm not at your school. You're it. Oh, more than, more than it. God has equipped you to be it. God made you special to do that, right? When, when you come back in, I can't talk to everybody here. There is no, absolutely no way I can know what's going on with everybody's life. I have maybe the opportunity to get involved with 20 people's lives. And I could say, okay, well, the size of the church is going to be 20 people because that's all I can do. Sorry, the rest of you, go take a hike. Well, isn't it amazing? I can touch 20, and Pat can touch 20, right? And my wife can touch 20, and Dulce can touch 20, and Jerry can touch 20. And that can go on and on and on in here. Come with the anticipation that God is going to use you to help the whole body grow and be in awe as that happens. And you don't have to doubt it because he's, a, he's already equipped you from eternity past to do those things. That's his plan, not yours. Let's keep going. Number three. Remember that some, not all, are gifted to lead us into this unity. 
Listen to these verses. Now, these are the gifts Christ has given to the church. And he specifies the broad church because these are gifts there to bless, not just us to build up portions of the church, but to bless the overall church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Now, everybody lives in a culture. Everybody's got a worldview. And we live in the United States, and part of us being Americans is we're independent. Okay? And if you conform to me, great. And if you don't, I'm going to go someplace else. I ain't going to shop at your store. I'm not going to buy your product. I'm not going to go to your school. I'm going to move out of your neighborhood. I'm going to do all that stuff, right? And it's hard. I'm not saying this is true in every culture, but it's really hard for us as Americans to admit that there's somebody God has put in our life to actually teach us something. Uh, I'm not making this up. This is God. If you've got a problem with that, go talk to him, okay? Your argument is not with me, okay? It's, it's with God. This is his plan. And in God's providence, in our church, God has given us four men that have this responsibility. And let me tell you, it is a weighty responsibility on us. And all four of us, this is not what we had planned personally in our lives, okay? Uh, let me tell you, when I, was, when I came to Emmanuel in, seven, in 83 with my new bride as a second lieutenant in the Air Force, the last thing I ever imagined I'd be doing would be a pastor of Emmanuel, okay? My, my goal was I was going to be a general officer in the Air Force, okay? And I was going to be a command of a lot of stuff. That was, oh, yeah, I'm going to go do that. So I've been trained for, right? Got a career for that kind of stuff, okay? But somewhere along the line, God said, no, 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 Herschel. I got something else for you. And uh, I can think of a lot more fun things to do than be a shepherd, okay? Because the sheep are dirty and smelly and wander all over the place. It's just, that's what a sheep is, Okay? My folks had sheep on their farm, and I, I said, Mom, seriously, can't we get cows? Because <laughs> they're slower, <laughs> and they're bigger, and I can find them, okay? <laughs> but for whatever reason, I don't quite understand it. I don't necessarily think, personally, I was the best pick, and Steve probably feels that way, and Van and Greg, but God knew. He's called us to be the ones to lead us here in this congregation in unity. We're not the only ones in this town. We've got 72 churches in this city. And in every one of those churches, God has called men to lead that congregation in unity. In every one of those. And they're not me. I'm not responsible for what's going on at AHOP. I, I, I'm, I love my brothers and sisters, and I want to do whatever I need to do to unify them, but I, it's not my responsibility for that flock. Thank goodness Mark Brooks got that, okay? And Todd's got Liberty Worship, okay? And Andy's got First Church of Christ, and, 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 and Pastor John's got, the, got his church here in town, okay? And Gary and those guys, but this is, this is us. And part of if you want it to become unified, you, you're going to have to learn how to submit to the leadership that God has given you. And I, you can say, well, we're all screwed up, but you're going to go to the next church and you're going to run into a bunch of pastors that feel like they have that calling there too. And you're going to have to figure that out because this is God's plan. This is his plan for unity. One more. Let's keep going. Remember to set aside pride and selfishness as we look to Christ. He says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. 
Well, there's a lot of different definitions of humility. And I think it's good to go back and look how God humbled himself to us so that we can get some vision of what it looks like for us to humble ourselves before each other. Go ahead and give me that next slide. This is from Philippians. I know it's a cardinal sin here. We're in the book of Ephesians. And I'm flipping over to Philippians, but I love this. That's when you do this. Listen to this. He says, he says, is there any encouragement from belonging in Christ? Th this is a path. Paul is talking to the Philippians and says, you need to humble yourselves before each other. You've got a problem with that. And he says, I'm going to give you some vision of what it looks like to be humble. That's why he wrote this to the church in, Philippians, in Philippi. Is there any encouragement of belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Because what he's going is, there ain't much fellowship going on with you guys. There's not much encouragement going on. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? I think Paul's got a sense maybe they're not. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. He says, don't be selfish. He's not giving them that command unless they are. Unless we are. Don't try to impress others. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example of what it looks like to, look, to think about somebody as better than yourself. He says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God for all of eternity and with all the power and authority and majesty that comes with that, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Because he could have, because it was his. And there's nothing in all of creation that could take that away from him except him setting it aside. That's the only thing Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And he did it with joy because he could see past that because he saw reconciliation and he saw us in his body for all of eternity. He didn't get any closer with God the Father and he didn't get any closer with the Holy Spirit through this because they were as close as they could possibly be. He had no more power after all of this than he'd had before. Because he was God. But what he obtained through this was us. For all of eternity. He bought us back from sin and death. Purchased us. When we look at each other. God says, are you willing to see the value of the other person and bear with them through all of their stupid decisions and actions and failures because they are now part of your eternal family in God. It is so easy for us to say, the way I'm going to resolve a problem is I'm just going to walk away. Right? And then the problem is resolved. That is not humility. Call it whatever else you want. That is not humility. Because humility says I came to reconcile. Humility says I come to put things together. Not to tear apart. Christ prayed one thing the night before he was crucified with the disciples in John chapter 17. He says, God, I pray that they could be unified as you and I in the Spirit are. He knew what that was. And he says, 
if they can be unified, then people will see their love one for another, and then they will know me. And when you walk away from somebody else in the body of Christ, and you're not reconciled, people around us in our community do not see love, and they do not see Christ. They can see whatever else they want to see, but they don't see that. And you've missed your calling. Okay? Your calling was to conform to Christ, and he's the one that gave up all to be reconciled. Your calling is to build up the body with your gifts, not walk away from the body with your gifts. Now, I've seen people leave this church and heard about people leaving all their churches for hundreds of reasons, okay? We used to have, Don and Pat have been here for forever, so they've seen the same kind of things. We have people that says, well, we got to homeschool, so it'll all be about how do we do education. If you don't do education my way, then I need to start a church with people who are the same as me. They wanted to conform to each other, not conform to Christ, and not celebrate the diversity Okay, but conform to each other. And they went and started their own church. We had another one that says, well, we're going to have a, a, a Christian school, but it's going to be done this way. And if you don't do it that way, then we're going to leave. And they went and started their own church too. Had another one that says, well, here's my under, understanding of the Reformed faith. And unless you're going to trust exactly in that the way I do, then I'm going to go start my own church. And they did that. Okay? We had some that says, well, there's leaders. Remember where, in, where Paul says, well, some says, oh, I, I love Apollos and I love Paul. I'm going to follow the leader. So when the leader left, they left too. Because... They were conforming to the leader, not to Christ. Somebody left this place because when we went from that building to this building, we didn't bring the pulpit with us. And they felt like we needed to have the pulpit to have the scriptures because that was the way to honor the scriptures. I'm not mocking them, I'm just saying they left because they wanted to find a church where there was a pulpit that would honor the word of God as it sat on it. Okay? I, I, I could go down this list over and over and over and over again. Okay? And you know what? My folks left this church. Okay? 1987, they were told, well, you've been divorced, so you can give offerings, and you can send the teaching, but there's not much more that you can do in this church. And they got really offended with that, and they left. And my, Kim and I are sitting there, I don't know how old we were at that point, you know, 26, 27, and well, my folks left, and it was time for us to leave, right? Because we're going to be loyal to them. And I remember sitting there one, one night, and I said, Kim, we can't do that, okay? We can't do that. Because God is calling us to put some roots down and to stay put. And as long as this church is teaching the word of God and is letting us use our gifts and is not calling us away from conforming to Christ, we need to stay put. Okay? I remember when everybody in my kids' class at the school that used to be here left and my kids said, Dad, we don't, we don't want to go here anymore. We don't want to go where our friends went. I said, no. No, God is, we're, we're going to stay put here even though it's hard, okay? Because we want to conform to Christ and we want to come alongside as the best as we know how. You know what, Kim and I are perfect, okay? I, I know a lot of you can list my failures of the times when I have not helped you grow in Christ and my wife's got a list a lot, lot bigger than that, so you can go talk to her and compare lists. She knows, okay? I'm not putting Kim down, because God has given me, my wife, to help remind me of where I need to be conforming to Christ. And I laugh about this. God has given me Sarah to do that as well, and he's given her the ability to speak into my heart and say, Will, you are not conforming to Christ. And thank God for my wife and for Sarah, and for Van, and for Steve, and for Greg, and for Galen, and for Chris, and for Matt, and for Jared, and for guys who are working hard on conforming themselves to Christ, and actively out trying to get the rest of the body to love God, that they will speak into me as well too. Those are good things, okay? So, Kim and I, we're, we're not leaving. You guys may leave. We're not leaving, okay? But we're staying put. Because 
there's no, unless this, but I'll tell you when you need to leave. When this church is teaching something other than conforming to Christ, you need to get out of here. Or you need to get rid of the shepherds, one of the two. There's only two options, okay? Because that's wrong. Okay? And if, if this church is not allowing you to use your gifts to build up the body, then you need to challenge that or you need to get out of here. Because that's your calling. Your calling is to conform to Christ. Your calling is to use your gifts to build up the body. That's your calling. And we're here to help you with that calling. And if we get skewed off of that, God help us and you, you confront us about that. Um, our calling is not to make sure you have pews, but if you want to have pews and that you have this style of music and that, you know, you need to have this kind of sermon. I sat under Pastor Wheeler for 20 years. And you know what I told Pastor Wheeler after every service? I said, Pastor Wheeler, this is the most refreshed I felt ever, at any other time this week. I had the best rest I've ever had during your sermon. <laughs> and I did. Ask my wife. I fell asleep through so many of his sermons. But Pastor Wheeler, God bless him, he wrote all his sermons out and he'd read a page and he'd stick it underneath the thing and he'd read another page. I could not for the life of me stay awake. I don't know what it, I, my, my only prayer every Sunday was, God, help me not fall out of the pew. That's that because, I mean, I dropped my pen, I dropped my Bibles and everything else. But listen, Pastor Wheeler had a heart for his congregation. And he loved us, and he confronted us when we needed to be confronted. And he was at the hospital with us when we were hurting. And he stood at our gravesides when we buried our children. And he, he grabbed Greg and I and some other guys and said, I want to equip you to follow after me. And he loved God. And I could care less about his sermon style. I knew the heart of the man. Amen? Amen. Greg sometimes teaches at, let's see, Greg's a college professor, teaches college level, that's who he is. And I've had some of the folks in my budget classes, I, I didn't quite understand a word Greg had to say, but I know he loves us. Okay? And they're coming because Greg loves them. He does love us. He loves everybody here. Greg gives more than any of you can ever imagine to the people here. And so does Van. And so does Steve. And so do our deacons. Are we always right? No. We're imperfect. I mean, we're, none of us have arrived on this. But by God's grace, that's where we're going. And we want you to go there as well, too. Let's keep going. Listen to what Paul started off with. Therefore, I, as a prisoner serving the Lord, beg you. <laughs> Paul is at his knees before the Ephesians. I beg you to live a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. When you leave this calling, you have left joy and you have left life. Remember, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I have come that you might have life and you can have that abundantly. When you leave this calling, there's no more abundant life. I don't know what it is, but it's not an abundant life. And you can blame anybody else on that. The only person that can pull you away from this calling is you. There is nobody else. Just be straight up honest with yourself. Nobody else has the power of pulling you away from this calling except yourself. And the times I have walked away from it, I didn't get to blame anybody else. It was me. Okay? Admit it. And start with that. Because as long as you keep blaming everybody else for a while, you can't follow your calling. I, I didn't see anything in this passage. Maybe I missed it. Let's talk about it tonight where he said, find the person who's standing in the way of your calling and go fix them, get them fixed, and then maybe you can pursue your calling. There is nothing standing between you and your calling but you. That's it. Because Christ has given you everything you need. He's given you his spirit. He's given you specific experiences and gifts for you. He's equipped you. He's given you the body. He says, move out. And if you're not moving out, there's nobody but you that's choosing not to move out on that. That's it. I, I'm, 
if you saw something else in this passage, bring it tonight and let's talk about it. Let's keep going. Are you experiencing unity? Well, if you are, praise God. Press on. But what if you're not? What if you're here this morning and we're talking about this? And you're honest to yourself, I don't, I don't feel any unity. I, I, don't, I don't feel calling. I, I, don't, I don't feel like these people love me in this church. I, I don't feel like these people are doing anything for me in this church. I don't, I don't see that I got a place in this church. Okay. Well, I want you to think about that a little bit. Okay. Let's think about a couple things. Go ahead. Keep going. If you're not experiencing unity, maybe you're not living a life worth of your calling. This isn't, your calling's not my calling. How you conform, I cannot keep you from conforming to the image of Christ. Only you can do that. You're the only one that has the power to do that. And if, if you believe it's not our preaching that's keeping you from going to Christ, it's not our leadership that's keeping you from conforming to Christ, it's not the programs at the church that are keeping, it's not the translation of the Bible we use, it's not the times of the service or the length of the service or the worship team or the, you just put whatever what you want to put in that blank that's keeping you from growing. You're keeping you from growing. That was your choice. You're the only one that can choose that. Maybe you need to take a hard look at that and decide you want to live your calling and get straight with yourself. Okay? There's been times I had to be honest with myself and I got caught up in a bunch of other stuff and I was not living a life worthy of my calling. Okay? And I had to confess it. And there's been plenty of times when I want to blame somebody else at this church and other places. It was their fault. Well, it wasn't their fault. It was my fault. They have no, nobody has any power over you. Christ has broken the power of sin and death, which is a lot better, bigger than anybody in this room. If he's broken that, he's not saying, oh, yeah, I've, I've conquered the dark kingdom, but I can't conquer Steve. I'm sorry, guys. That's a, that's a cross you're going to have to bear, right? No. <laughs> okay? I, I don't know what world you're living in, but it's not the world that, that, that God is living in, all right? So I want you to think about some things. Next slide. Are you, if you're saying no, are you more focused on division than what we have in common? If you've got tension with people, are you more worried about the things that separate you from them than, than the things, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one salvation, one kingdom? Are those the things that come to your mind when you think about other people? Or you have your other list, the other launder list of all the problems. God's calling you, start with this first. Think about what unifies us. Second is, do you expect others to conform to your standards and not to Christ? If you do, you're always going to be upset because God is not calling people to conform to you. That's not their calling. He's asking them to conform to him. Are you waiting on others to care for you before you care for them? I didn't see anything in that passage where it says, after Everybody else has used their gifts to encourage you. Then you can start encouraging someone else. No. no. The point is, the instant you come to Christ, you are equipped to start building up the body of Christ. It's just learning about that. Stepping out, trying it, trusting God, get moving on it. And you grow as you come alongside other people and encourage them, God uses that to open your eyes up to new things he has planned for you. Do you remember the parable of the talents? Right? The king gave one guy a couple pieces of silver or gold, 10 pieces, 100 pieces, went away. The guy had a lot, doubled it. He says, well done. I'm going to give you more. The guy had a little bit doubled it. He says, well done, I'm going to give you more. And the one had just a couple, he says, I knew how cruel you were, and I knew if I blew it with this, and it was really wasn't equipped for it, so I didn't do anything with it. And what did he do? He took away what that person had, and he gave it to someone else. 
you will never have the next thing God has for you until you're faithful with what he's given you today. And you don't need to worry about tomorrow. God says, be faithful in today. Be a good steward of your calling today. Do you want to lead instead of following those gifted with leadership? And I'm, this is us as Americans. I, a lot of people want to be, hey, you know what? We got a process to be an elder here in this church. And if you think you're equipped and called to do that, then step out. But God doesn't call you to be a leader of this church outside of being a pastor in this church. Okay? And so if you think that is your calling, then let's work through that. But you don't get to stand on the side and lead because that's not how God has called it to be. Don't argue with me. Argue with God. Do you dwell on everyone else's faults and forgive your own pride and selfishness? Now that's a hard thing to have to consider. That's a question every one of us should ask the Holy Spirit to reveal. Because remember what the Holy Spirit does, right? He convicts us of what? Sin. So talk to him. He's ready. He says, good job. That's part of my job in your life. Let me, let's, let's sit down and have a talk, Will, right? Maybe it's a long talk. Maybe, maybe all night. Who knows? Okay? Instead of sitting down with God and talking about everybody else's failings, are you sitting down and talking to God about where you need to get straight so that you can actually be a servant? Because you can't be a servant when you're judging everybody else. Doesn't happen. Can't happen. Next slide. Sarah and the group, you guys want to come up for me? I just want to finish up with this. Therefore, I, a prisoner serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Everybody in this room. Everybody in this room is called of God. Isn't that amazing? Everybody here has a special calling and a purpose I can't do, only you can do. And God called us to do that together. And when we do that together, and we use our gifts, and we build up the body, the 15,000 people that are living in Xenia, and the 8,000 are living in Xenia Township, and who knows how many in Beaver Creek and Fairborn that don't know Christ, look at that, and they see love. Because <laughs> they don't see it anywhere else in the world. The world offers you everything else, but it can't offer you that. And when they see that love, they see Christ. And they, they're redeemed. And then they become part of this body with a calling. Isn't that an amazing thing? Don't stand in the way of someone seeing love. Don't do that. I don't care. what Do whatever else you want to do. Don't do that. Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world. Every one of us knows how not to do this because this is who we used to be, right? This is hard. This is new. It's scary. It's wonderful. It's fulfilling. It's joyful. It's revealing. It's our purpose from God. It lets us grow closer to him and be in awe as God brings others closer to him as well but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect this is an amazing journey we're on do we fail along the way absolutely I get tired I get frustrated okay I get off track and I say stupid things and I do stupid things and I have to confess it and get back on track to what the real calling is. But so do you. But I do know that that calling is not independent of you and it's not independent of conforming to Christ and as, as we stick it out with each other and we encourage each other and we love each other and we bear one another's burdens and we pray for each other, 
and we confess to each other that God lets us grow and show some amazing things to the world that he's never shown anyone else. Let's pray. I'm going to let the group uh, conclude us with a song and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your wisdom. In our plans, I never would have planned to make this happen this way, but you did. God, I thank you that everybody in this room, I don't care how hard life is right now, has a calling from you and a clear path outside of turning away from it to conform to you and a clear path to use those special gifts and experiences of life to build up the body of Christ. God, help us not get distracted by the world and by our past. God, help us to walk forward and to love each other so that the world can see you and be in awe of you, Father. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.